Hi, I'm Jerry Nixon, and this is SQL Tips for Developers, a beginner's guide. I'm on the SQL Developer Experiences team, and I'm here with Anaga. She's on the same team with me. Anaga, thanks for being here. What should we talk about today? Thank you, Jerry. I've heard a lot about the connection string. I know we need a connection string, but what is a connection string? Connection strings are important. They're the fundamental thing that makes a connection work, but there's a lot to them at the same time. Maybe it'd be nice just to kind of walk through each piece. So a connection string is a string. We call it that because it's just text and it has all of the information needed to be able to connect to a SQL database. And there are a lot of little parts. Let me just kind of move through those quickly so we can talk about it. The first is server. That's one of the name key, the key name pairs inside a connection string. And look what it shows. It shows that it's a server and where it's located. So in this case, you can see it's TCP IP or TCP for short, right? Colon. And then the server name, whatever that is, it's entire address on the internet and then comma 1433. Now this is the, let's say the most long winded way of pr providing the server. Right, so TCP is what we would assume anyway. So you don't have to provide that. Another ver way of accessing it, by the way, would be like named pipes. Named pipes is how you would connect to a SQL server that's on the same machine where you don't have to go out through the internet. And so the other is the name of the machine that you're going to or the server where it's located, comma, the port. We assume that the port is going to be 1433 unless you've customized it. So that's not necessary either. So look at the next example. It's just server equals my server. It could be that simple, right? And, and so by the way, if you're running on your local machine, you could even say server equals dot, and it's just the machine that you're running on. And other things you'll see in the connection string that actually mean the same thing as server, but through the, the iteration of the connection string and backwards compatibility with uh, previous versions of SQL, you can see other synonyms like server, data source, address, ADDR, all of those, they look different, but they're exactly the same thing. Just saying, where is the SQL server going to be found? The next is initial catalog. Initial catalog also has synonyms like database, catalog, DB. All of those reference the database that you're going to be connected to immediately as the default through that connection. Does it mean you can change to another database? It sure does. Easily you can. This is just the one that you get a database connection to. So we know that SQL Server by default has a master database, for example. You could set this to master and it would take you right there and then it would be up to your code to move you to another database. Now, in Azure SQL DB, you can't move from database to database like that because the idea of a SQL Server at containing multiple databases is as abstracted from it. So the the name that you put in initial catalog or in database is very important. Another is persists security info. So SQL Server always knows about your connection string. And if you set this to false, it takes the important things like maybe username and password and it removes them. So you can say true and it'll keep them. And then from session to session, you can reuse them or you can set them to false to keep them safe. It, I would say as a, a matter of course, this is always false. That's one of the reasons the default is also false. Another thing you might see is like the username and password. Now you would just type this in like a normal username and password. That's one of the reasons you would want that removed by SQL Server after you use it because you don't want your password just sitting around. Maybe you don't use username and password. Maybe you use Active Directory. No problem. You can see that another thing that might get added is authentication equals. So that's a name value pair where you can say authentication is Active Directory password and you type in your password. Or you say Active Directory access token and you use the JWT token that you've received back from OAuth authentication. Or you can say Active Directory service principle where you identify a, a different login that doesn't map to a user, but instead is a service user that interacts with the database for you. Username, password, authentication, other parts of the connection string. Another is multiple active result sets. This is especially applicable to developers because what it allows you to do is run two queries simultaneously. Otherwise, if this is set to false, which is its default, by the way, then 
If you run two queries, the second query waits for the first. If it's set to true, both queries run simultaneously and you're able to actually get back the results before the other one is finished. So a lot of cool things there. Uh, encrypt true, true obviously is the default. This means that SSL or TSL is going to be used in the transport of your data. Remember, you can have encryption at rest when data is sitting in the database, uh, encryption during transport, which is what we're talking about here, and then we can have encryption in memory. SQL Server supports always encrypted, which is all three of those all at the same time. So if you see encrypt, what it's really saying, and I hope you use this, is encrypt my data as it comes across the wire. You might also see trust server certificate. You would set this to true for a developer experience where you don't worry about the certificate being used for SSL, but you would set that certainly to true when you're in production. Trusted connection means that the machine that I'm running, I'm logged in as a Windows user. That Windows user has access to SQL Server. Just use who I am. It's a trusted connection. So trust connection true and you're good to go. All right, so that's pretty cool. And it's a great way of like logging in really fast. This is again, typically something you would do in a developer environment, certainly not in production environment. However, I could come up with a production environment where this is making sense because it makes it so SQL Server knows who you are and could actually change your authentication or your what you're, what you're allowed to access based on who you are individually. You have 100 users in your company, you would have 100 people uh, different using different credentials logging in to your database. All right, another one would be like connection timeout. How long will you wait before the connection starts to respond and before it tears itself down and rebuilds it from scratch? That's important because what you wanna do is have a timeout that makes it so that if your application does anything that causes a problem or connects to a SQL server that's having a problem, you don't wait forever. You can set it to the number of seconds that you want to be the maximum amount of time for your application to wait for the connection to uh, to be established with the database, right? So that's nice. Uh, also, we have this, uh, this other, uh, you'll see from time to time, application name is really meant for telemetry. So my application is called app123. Well, what's great is if I include this in the connection string, I can ask SQL Server how many times has app123 been used? Or I can ask SQL Server with, with how many of the active connections are part of app123. That's pretty nice. Again, it's around telemetry. This is just the point of instrumentation. If you use, by the way, things like uh, Entity Framework, Entity Framework will put Entity Framework into the application name if it's blank. So again, they're using it for telemetry the same way you would. So it's great for monitoring and logging and just resource management all the way around. Pooling is important because pooling says, I want to make sure that the connection I have, which takes a little bit to establish, even though it feels like nanoseconds to us, I want to make sure that if I have to connect again and again and again and again with exactly the same connection string over and over again, that it just doesn't tear it down. I can just reuse it and I can pool them, which is great to be able to use connection pooling. It can be a, an awesome way to scale up a, a large website, for example. Another cool developer specific piece is around application identity. So, or uh, intent, application intent and setting it to read only tells me that my the queries that I'm about to run through this connection are only going to be reading the data from the database. I'm not gonna insert, update, or delete the data. Now that's great because not because SQL Server changes the way it works, but if you have two databases, one intended for read, one intended for write, and you say application intent is read only instead of read write, it'll push you over to the read only database to ensure that all the read queries are isolated and they can perform as fast as possible and don't get slowed down by the update queries. All of those added together makes the connection string. And the connection string looks nice and complicated, but once you see the different parts and you start thinking about what's what makes it up, it starts to make a lot more sense. Now, if you're ready to get started, you can go to the Azure portal, create your own Azure SQL DB. After you do, there's a tab that actually gives you your connection string. It saves you a lot of time figuring it out. Or you can go to AKMS slash SQL, download SQL, install it today, and get started. Best of luck.